Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Merchants of the Dark Road by Elf Creek Games. This is a one to four player game that takes roughly 60 to 120 minutes and is for ages 12 and up. And in the game Merchants of the Dark Road, you are a merchant in the Queen's territory, attempting to gather items and help adventurers along the way, and of course work with the Queen to give her her commissions. You'll be going back and forth with adventurers, taking them on the Dark Road, as well as the Lighted Path attempting to gain prestige and, of course, gain money. At the end of the game, whoever has the most of the victory points at the end is going to win, but you're going to actually be taking your prestige and your victory points and seeing which one you have the lower of, and that will be your end score, plus any bonus victory points. Have the most of it over that than anybody else, and you win the game. Let's talk about the setup, how to play, and, of course, my review. All right, let's go ahead and get started with setting up Merchants of the Dark Road. Each player is going to get a caravan board, and each caravan board is going to come with seven dice that you'll place four in the wheel and three in each of the square locations. You'll get an illuminated die that you'll place next to those, and then every player is going to start with a resource, a five for the first player, a four for the second, and so on. Additionally, each player is going to get a random steed, and every player is going to get a random traveling adventurer that will give them bonus items based on the top left-hand side of their uh, card. You'll also be getting one of these horseshoes here that you'll place at the very bottom on your opposite wheel. A deed as well is going to come in the game. Uh, it's random, you'll each get one of them. These are going to give you either victory points, uh, they're going to give you coins, or they're going to give you some type of way to score uh, additional points at the end of the game. The first player is going to get five coins, second player is going to get six, and so on and so forth. And then of course you'll take the guide to traveling Lumai and set it within reach of all players so that they can see what they need to do when traveling the dark road. Then go ahead and set up the main game board. First, go ahead and take these guys here. They are called the Companions. Deal out three and place the white die at the very end to incentivize players to try and take that guy when traveling the road. And then we have the board here. You're going to have the Queen's Commission. These are the six different commissions. You'll go ahead and take each of the different locations and shuffle them up individually. Make sure that you don't know which one's where and place them in the six different spaces. You're also going to go ahead and take these specific four starting locations, and when you've played the game more than once, you can switch them up because they have a backside, and place them in the four spaces that are empty on the board. Each player is also going to place their caravan on the zero space, unless you've gathered something that tells you otherwise. And then you're going to go ahead and place your marketing ro rotating board here. It's magnetized. Go ahead and simply attach it and give each one of the items a die and make sure that that die is imprinted with the type of item that it is on. Then you're going to have the ruins. Go ahead and place the white die there as well as the map token on the item space. You'll have the deeds. Go ahead and shuffle the deck and place two deeds out in the spaces that coincide. And then you'll have your specific caravans, which you'll place right next to the ringway inn. Speaking of the Ringway Inn, you're going to go ahead and shuffle the different adventurers uh, that are going to be coming onto your caravan that you'll take across the dark road. Shuffle that deck up and place four in the spaces present there. And the dark market is going to have a token that you're going to place on the very bottom of it. Then the last thing over here on the board is going to be the travel space. This space is going to come with upgrades, so you're going to place all of those down at the very bottom along with five coins to represent the first person to travel there. You can choose the five coins, after that it's going to be three, so you only need one reminder. You have the light road and the dark road, or the lit up road. You'll shuffle these decks up and place them to the side of the game board. Any players who are not playing the game can be set aside as well. And all of the items will be set up uh, either face up or face down, indicating that they're upgraded or they're non-upgraded side. The extra dice that will or will not be used throughout the game. Then the currency. You're going to have these little blinding stones, and you're also going to be have the horseshoes and finally the lanterns that you'll be using. Then you're basically ready to start the game. To begin Merchants of the Dark Road, you're simply first going to choose one of your die in your wheel here, so you'll have four of them. You've rolled previously, and you'll be selecting one of the three spaces above them. When you do so, you'll move the die that you bumped into the top space, and you'll use the die that you moved into that space to calculate how far you can move your specific caravan. So if I bump a two and put a three in that location, I am going to get to use three as my movement. So I can go one, two, and three on the board. There's a circular board and each, each of the different areas or sides is going to have a space. Then you're going to get the bonus of whatever space that you bump from. There can be either getting an item, 
choosing to take a lantern um, or get a die, uh, use a die, I should say, illuminating die, you can choose to gain two coins or move this wheel here based on where you place the die. Then you'll take the die that you have bumped and you will place it on one of the corresponding spaces that is adjacent to you. So for instance, if I'm next to the dark market or Jurg's excursions, I can place that die on that space, indicating that it is the space I'm going to use for that turn. Each space has unique things you can do, and we'll go ahead and discuss all of them. The first one is going to be the Great Bazaar. The Great Bazaar, when you take this item and place it here, this, this die and place it here, is you can rotate this wheel here, and you're going to be able to adjust one of the die to indicate a new item. After that, you'll be spending your money to purchase these items, and you can purchase them based on the die that are corresponding to them. So if I have two armors, I can buy two armors for the cost that is adjacent and so on and so forth. You can only spend based on what the numbers are and how much money you have and how many die are there. The next thing you can do is the Queen's Commission. You'll simply choose any of the top commissions and take it and place it into one of the three spots on your caravan. Over here is Yurg's Excursions. You can choose to do the Ruins of Yin or to travel. Most of the time, you're going to be doing one of these smaller missions here. The traveling one is gonna be kind of something you do at the very end, so I'll discuss that next. Um, but the Ruins of Yin is pretty simple. You'll be able to move this map token uh, adjacent one space and a plus one for every hero if you'd like that you have, and you'll gain the benefit. Usually it will be some type of upgraded item, and sometimes it'll just be simply an item that you can take. And um, then after that, you can go ahead and spend a lantern, if you have one that's from your uh, little caravan here, hopefully you purchased one or picked one up at some point, to roll this die. Rolling this die is going to give you a benefit. It could be a new character, a traveling companion, it can be a new item worth one, and if you re-roll this die twice with the re-roll symbol, you can get one of these illuminating die, etc. The next thing that you can choose to do is the dark market. The dark market is going to let you pay coins to move the dark market around, just similar to the ruins, and then you'll gain the bonuses. It could be two items, uh, it could be a banner, etc, etc. The Ringway Inn. This is where you purchase adventurers. In order to purchase adventurers, you're going to need to uh, choose one of them, and then of course you can sell items to them. One, two, or three. The max is three, and you can't sell more than one of each item that is represented, and you'll gain benefit for doing so, usually coins. And of course, if you want, you can sell your upgraded items to them as well, and that can give you these little blazing tokens here that you'll place on the bottom of your caravan. Take these guys, just as you would the uh, these commissions here, and place them in the indicated three spaces on your caravan. Those are the main spaces in the game. And if you have your characters that you'll be taking across the dark road, as well as the commissions, you can go to the travel. When you travel, you're going to be doing this guide to traveling. You'll choose one of your companions in these three spaces here. If you choose the farthest one, you'll get a bonus die in this space, which is usually very important and usually incentivizes you to do so. And you'll place it in your traveling companion area. So you'll place these guys over here on the right side of your board. You'll declare a destination. And then it, you just follow this thing here. Basically, you'll ask anybody if they want to join you in one of the two locations that are of the color that you chose. So if you choose blue, they can choose dark blue or light blue and follow you. Whoever chooses to go with you is going to add additional die here. Did you choose the companion with the die? And then you'll be able to choose like which one of these locations you want to go to. Uh, you can choose the light road, but you'll have to pay lanterns to do so, or the dark road. And based on which one you chose, there's going to be kind of a die draft. You'll roll these die here. You'll have either you, yourself, if you choose the dark road, or if you choose the light road, one of your companions to the left of you, Pick one of these, gain the benefit, and then so on and so forth, and you'll choose die that way. You can also, of course, re-roll die. There's ways to do that as well. Then, after that, you'll just follow this little track here, and eventually you're going to gain victory points for the characters that you turn in, provided that they are corresponding to the location that you chose, as well as the deeds that you turn in, based on the items that you're turning in with it. And that will score you additional prestige as you go along, as well as, of course, coins. And you can turn your guys in, and they're going to give you a benefit based on the location. It could be one guy is going to generate you one coin and one prestige for each guy that you place there. And then if you went through the dark road, you're going to get double benefits. At, or sorry, if you choose the, the light road, you'll get double benefits, as opposed to the dark road, where you'll get to draft first. And the benefits can be something like an upgrade to your wagon, making your basic skills upgraded, or five coins. Uh, and you could also choose to take deeds.
Additionally, you have this illuminated die. And at certain points in the game, based on the action that you choose, you'll be able to utilize this die onto your board and thusly allow you to uh, partake in not just one location on your turn, but adjacent locations and a bonus location like this baby here that will give you additional benefits. Sometimes it's going to be one of your blazing tokens, other times it's going to be additional items worth a certain amount and victory points, lanterns, coins, upgrading items. It just depends on what you choose to do. But after you've done that, you've basically moved your caravan, you've bumped and done the basic action and then chose an adjacent space to act on, the next player will go. And then you'll rinse and repeat until all of your die have been exhausted from the wheel. Once you only have three die left and all the rest of the die you have have been exhausted, you're going to, along with everybody else, roll all your die minus one and place them back into your wheel here. And you'll continue. There should be 13 total rounds and the last three rounds when you hit 11, 12, and 13, all that will be left are three die on your wagon, which you'll simply bump up and then place. At the end of the game, you will have a certain amount of prestige and a certain amount of coins. Whatever your, low, your total level of them is, uh, the lowest one is going to be your victory points. So if I have 10 coins and 12 prestige, 10 will be my victory points. In which case, you'll be checking deeds to see if you have any additional victory points that you can add to that. And then you'll check to see whoever has the most victory points, and that player is the winner. It's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, I know, but we'll discuss more in my review. So as you can tell, Merchants of the Dark Road has a lot to offer. There is a lot of choice and a lot of variability in this game. Not only are you choosing your basic action, moving your wagon, and also using horseshoes to move yourself farther, but then you're able to choose that location that is adjacent to it and enact with it. You can choose to gather your uh, deeds or or your commissions or your adventurers. You can gather items. You can send all that stuff onto an adventure and then gain victory points, which of course is going to be in the way of coins and or prestige because you want to kind of keep them level. If you have a hundred prestige in this game and 10 coins, at the end of the game, you're only going to get 10 victory points. And if anybody else has 20 and 20, they're going to be much higher than you and most likely win. So balancing act is very important in this game. Speaking of balancing, when you gather items, you're going to be placing them down onto your little uh, caravan spaces here and they have little squares that indicate where you can place them. You can always kind of maneuver them around in any way that you'd like, but they have to all fit. So there's a little bit of a puzzle aspect in this game as well. Well, I want two pieces of armor, but I'm all filled up. I only have four spaces. What do I have to get rid of in order to make sure that I can make it all work? I need certain items for my certain adventurers, as well as the deeds here that I'm, or the commissions here um, that I need to get on the trail and travel with and sell and bring my guys where they need to go. And you have to kind of min max and manage your different characters and the different companions that you have in order to get the best results possible. And because of that, there's a lot of thinking in this game. This is not for the light of heart or for the uh, whimsical family adventure. This is actually a very deep and detailed game. It looks on its front to be pretty simple and uh, uh, not overly complex. However, there is a lot of moving parts. Yes, every space has a symbol and it explains it very well and you kind of understand what you need to do, but having to remember everything can be a little bit troublesome and challenging. Each of your different companions is going to have unique abilities. They could be passive or active, and you're going to be utilizing your blazing tokens to place on them in order to enact the abilities that they have presented on them, gathering certain ones that are going to give you a benefit on the dark road or the lit light path, litten path, the lighted path are going to be beneficial as well for you. Having more dice to roll to get you the better values is going to be important as well. Choosing these cards can give you a benefit or a negative. So for instance, if I rolled a one, I might lose a character or a two, three, or four, I'll lose an item. But a five and a six are gonna grant me additional prestige, additional upgraded items, and of course, the ability to even get illuminated die. Luna die are very important. It gives you the advantage of additional actions. It's kind of like a worker placement in a way of getting that bonus worker that's going to allow you to have additional resources throughout the game. So if you can get those, although challenging, will benefit you in the long run. Trying to soup up your cabin is also important or your caravan is good because there are a lot of little upgrades from the traveling section. And you can go ahead 
ahead and exchange them. So for instance, instead of being able to gain two coins or rotate that wheel there, which kind of dictates how much stuff is worth, how much you have to use to purchase them and changes throughout the game, uh, you'll be able to go three coins and a prestige or, or a prestige, which is nice. So you're gonna have little ways to kind of upgrade and encourage upgrading and traveling throughout the game as you progress on the traveling stage. And it's all kind of in its neat little area. It's a neat little bubble as to where everything's going to need to go. The idea of having to uh, balance your points is a cool one as well. You're not gonna let somebody go ahead and just specifically choose one path, do very well in that path, and fail to succeed in another that's going to cost them. If they don't have coins at the end of the game and, or they don't have prestige, but they have the other, that's not the way you play this game. This is always about a little bit of everything. If you do a little bit of everything, it's going to help you more than just sticking to one specific thing or one specific strategy. Having the interaction with the dark road and the lit and path is probably the most interaction you're going to have in the game. Most of it's kind of a solitary experience with things changing based on the choices that other people make. But when that interaction comes, it has a unique little aspect to it because traveling is very important. And whenever you travel, you have to be aware of who's going to be traveling, who might be traveling with you, what locations they want to go to, and you're trying to steer away from what they want and just do what you want. But sometimes it's impossible and you have to see, does your best benefit outweigh their benefit and is that worth doing or should you change something up? I also like the fact that the companions, the different adventurers, and of course the different deeds are a nice way of mixing things up along with of course switching out these locations to make them a little more complex for those of you who are more hardened gamers. But so to speak, this is at least for somebody in the midway or the medium weight category, but it can go farther. The aspect of puzzling, the idea of a Euro, all mixed in with a tight adventure game is excellent. Now, let's talk about the quality. Excellent quality, 10 out of 10. This game has a cool little puzzled board that you put together, which is nice, thick and durable. All the pieces are extra thick cardboard. All the dice are not, not imprinted, they're actually etched in. They look good, you know what they do when you roll them. And of course, the dice feel good to roll. These, uh, everything that you move around in this game is gonna feel great. The artwork in this game is excellent as well. <laughs> All your different steeds slash companions are really cool. The adventurers, you know what they are and what they're doing and where they want to go and why. And you can kind of drive a story as you are this traveling caravan that's trying to help not only the queen, but the adventurers get to where they need to go with the items that they need to all make a profit at the end. It has a lot to do with us like other heroes quest type of things, but you're kind of not the adventurer in this aspect. You are the guy that needs to make sure that they get to, from point A to point B, and that's rather important. So the story attached to the artwork and the theme all works really well. This is definitely not a dry game. This feels really in-depth, it feels really story-driven, and you're constantly thinking about where you need to go and why and what people you need to pick up. It doesn't feel like you're actually just picking up cards or, or, or cubes and moving them from point A to point B. It feels like you're part of the story, and that's always very important to the game, very important to the mechanics, that it works in a fun and seemingly like a connected way. Overall though, it's a high quality game. It's deep and it has a lot to tell as well as a lot to do and that's excellent. As far as the negatives, well, because there is so much to do, it's all very simple, but there is a lot of different choices. You're going to forget certain things. Did you move the wheel? Was this specific die supposed to be in that location? Did I move this die here? And if so, what action was it that I took? Or, or what does this symbol mean? You'll have to go ahead and constantly for the first game, go back and look at the different icons. We played it wrong our first time, but just little things uh, that didn't really make a huge difference. And the game was still a fun experience, but it was things that we missed along the way that we had to go back and look at to make sure that we got right. So if you're a moderate gamer, and you see something that's, you don't usually play games that are as thick as this, this is gonna take you a little bit of time to get used to and feel out. But once you've got it going, it's great. Um, any other negatives? I suppose it can be a longer game. The more players you include, the more thought is going to be taking place, the more different choices you're going to have to make and be aware of what each, each and every player has as far as items. If you don't like puzzly games, it shouldn't be that much of a deal, but there is a little bit of puzzling in it. And of course there is a little bit of Euro in it, all mixed into a wonderful experience. So overall, Merchants of the Dark Road is an excellent game and I highly recommend it. You know, just like most of Elk Creek games. All right guys, thanks for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Merchants of the Dark Road. If you'd like to pick this game up, there is a link down below in the description where you can see all of Elk Creek Games' 
games. They have a ton of options and I've enjoyed all the games that they've sent me thus far, so I can honestly say I can recommend most of the games there, at least the ones I've played, and you can see on our YouTube all the games that they have to offer that I have reviewed so that you might want to purchase them. Speaking of YouTube, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe. And if you do subscribe, which we do appreciate, make sure you hit that bell notification button so you can see more videos that we put out, usually Monday through Friday. It was Christmas, so I took a few days off, but back in the saddle once again. You can also check out our live stream every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST, where we play games just like this one here every Sunday, and you can watch us play and learn the game yourself and see if it's something that you'd be interested in picking up. We usually do giveaways there and all kinds of stuff. And on the website too, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to traveling the dark road with you next time. <laughs>